what do you do with a critical mass of talent yearning to make an entrepreneurial mark in the Middle East? That's the task faced by the UAE's Northern Emirate of Sharjah. In particular, that's the task of the Sharjah Entrepreneurship Center, or Shara as it is also known, a government-backed entity with a mandate to build the entrepreneurial ecosystem in the Emirate. I'm your host, Cody Combs, and this is the National's Business Extra podcast. For this episode, we're taking a look behind the scenes at Shara which was founded in 2016 near Mount Kilimanjaro of all places. More on that in a moment. I spoke with Shetta's chief executive, Najla al Midfa about the accomplishments, goals, and evolving roadmap for Sharjah entrepreneurs. Joining me now in Sharjah is Najla al Midfa, chief executive of Shetta. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Cody. It's a pleasure to be here. So what is Shetta? So Shra is actually a shortened version of the Sharjah Entrepreneurship Center. Uh, the Sharjah Entrepreneurship Center was born in 2016 as a platform to help uh, entrepreneurs build and grow their businesses in the Emirate of Sharjah. Uh, since 2016, we've supported over 170 startups across various industries that have gone on to raise over $160 million in investment and created over 1,600 jobs. I saw somewhere where the idea for this started on a mountain of all places. Can you extrapolate on that? Absolutely. It's a story I love to tell. Uh, I think this was back in 2014 or 2015. Her Excellency Sheikh Abdur al-Qasmi, who is also the chairperson of Shara'i, and myself and a few of our friends were on a mountain trek, basically Kilimanjaro. And we had summited, uh, we had reached the summit, and as we were descending from the mountain, uh, we were talking about the opportunity for entrepreneurship to address what was a, a you know, a much spoken about topic in those days back in 2014 and 2015, which is uh, youth unemployment in MENA. And so that's where it all started, where we talked about the fact that there is all this talent here in Sharjah in the university city. We've got 30,000 students studying here. So you've got a critical mass of talent, but there's really no platform for them to actually start their businesses and ultimately become not just job seekers, but job creators. So that was the narrative when we started back in 2016. But as we've grown uh, and now as we sit here in 2024, I would say that narrative has shifted from entrepreneurship being just a solution to unemployment to entrepreneurship actually being an opportunity for our talent here in the UAE to use technology to build the future, not just for the UAE, but also for the region and the world. And the name, and I apologize for the pronunciation, Shara? Shara, yes. Is that an acronym? It's an acronym, I would say, in Arabic of the Sharjah Entrepreneurship Center, but also as a word, as a standalone word, it means sail, as in the sail of a boat. And so you will see, even as you walk through our office, uh, we use the nautical theme quite a lot, and it's actually a great metaphor for the entrepreneurial journey as as entrepreneurs sort of set sail, sometimes across rough seas, uh, but we're with them all the way. I want to talk a little bit about that. That's really interesting. You have a lot of experience. You're very seasoned and the idea of startups, what are some misconceptions people might have, either the, the layperson or people who are interested in beginning startups that they might have about the journey? So I, I think that's definitely one of them. Uh, I think the media plays a role in obviously uh, uh, highlighting uh, success stories of entrepreneurs, but I don't think we talk enough about the uh, tenacity and the resilience and the patience that is required for that journey. It really is. When I said rough seas, it really is rough seas. It's a roller coaster ride. The highs are high, but the lows can be very low. Um, and uh, it's an opportunity for organizations like Shara to really stand by these entrepreneurs and be there for them during those difficult times. That said, uh, the, conversely, there's also another misconception about entrepreneurship, which is basically that you need to wait for the right time to start. There really is never a right time. I think once you've found an idea that you're passionate about, you've found a problem that needs solving, the the UAE, and I think, again, I, I think the UAE and the wider region as well, have put in place these ecosystem support organizations like Sharai to really support entrepreneurs who have these ideas to help bring them to reality. And so, yes, it's not easy, but it's not impossible either. I think that's that's the reality, basically. Since its founding, what sort of progress have you seen? 
So we've made tremendous uh, progress. You know, as I think about the journey over the last eight years or so, uh, when we first started, so I should say, actually, when we first started, our uh, main office, our main hub was at the American University of Sharjah. And then later on in 2018, we established a second hub at the University of Sharjah. And now here we are today at the headquarters, which is effectively our third hub at the Sharjah Research Technology and Innovation Park. So when we started at the American University uh, back in uh, 2016, there was a lot of work that we needed to do around awareness of entrepreneurship. What is entrepreneurship and what does it mean to run a business or to start a venture? Uh, and I think that has changed a lot over the years, especially with the success stories that have obviously emerged in the ecosystem since then. Stories like Kareem and stories like uh, Sug, which was acquired by Amazon, but also local success stories like Noon. And so we no longer spend our time trying to explain what entrepreneurship is and convince uh, the youth or the graduates that entrepreneurship is something that they should consider. They're actually coming to us now with amazing ideas using technologies that are obviously emerging now, such as AI and uh, VR and AR and so on, and uh, really coming up with ideas that can solve some of our most challenging problems. What technologies do you see emerging that are going to complement and help put Sharjah on the map? Not that it's not already yes. on the map. You guys have made a lot of progress. Yes. I think, uh, I mean, one of the ones that, uh, for example, it's a success story that we have uh, in Sharjah that uh, shows one of the technologies that I think up until now we understood uh, quite well, but haven't really seen practical applications of it, uh, is, for example, VR and AR. And so here in Sharjah, the question was, how do we take these futuristic technologies and actually apply them to industries that are important in Sharjah? One of the main industries here in Sharjah is the cultural industry or the creative industries as a whole. And so we have a startup that actually came out of the American University of Sharjah called Fifth Wall that uses AR and VR to bring the museum experience to life. I'm not, you know, Sharjah has one of the largest number of museums uh, in the UAE. But how do we actually use these technologies? And, and that's what this, uh, this gentleman, this entrepreneur did, is use AR to bring to life the experience currently implemented actually at the resistance monument in Khurfakan. And so that's one of the technologies uh, that we're seeing implemented. But of course, there are all sorts uh, that we are seeing as well, including, as we've talked about in the past, AI, robotics, and the like. And you, you briefly mentioned that it was important to look at some areas where people weren't necessarily investing. What are some of those areas? I don't want you to give away any uh, plans or trade secrets, of course, but, uh, you know, the startups can be very saturated. We in the media get focused on, we, well, for the last year, it's AI, AI, AI. Yes, yes. What are some areas that you think are being underutilized or underinvested in right now? Yeah, so, so AI is a technology. I think that's, you know, it's applicable across industries. But what we were seeing in the ecosystem in the early days when we had first started was delivery apps, e-commerce uh, platforms. Now, uh, obviously, in the more recent past, fintech, uh, there's been a lot of interest in that from VCs. But what we didn't see enough focus on and what was important to us here in Sharjah, given our own strengths, was edtech. Um, climate tech now, I can say, especially post last year being uh, the year of sustainability and post COP28, there's certainly more of a focus on climate tech. But from day one, sustainability for us has always been a focus area. So we're really happy to see more investment in clean tech and climate tech. Manufacturing, which is traditionally thought of as a very old school industry and Really, there's an opportunity there for us to bring these advanced technologies to these uh, to these manufacturing uh, ideas. And so we are actually focusing on manufacturing as a center of excellence for us. And we're seeing some of our most exciting startups and SME actually in that space. And then the creative industries, as I talked about. So how do you work at the intersection of things like art, culture, publishing, design. These are all areas that Sharjah is very strong at, but then again, bring technology or infuse technology into those. And so the creative industries as well is a focus for us. Manufacturing is an interesting one. How much of the UAE's overall manufacturing comes from Sharjah? 
Thirty percent. It's interesting. You know, Sharja. I think obviously everyone knows uh, Sharja's positioning as the cultural capital of the UAE. But I don't think we highlight enough the manufacturing, the light manufacturing strength of the city and the opportunity for us to really tap into that private sector to help build the companies of the future. We have a wonderful example of a company based here in Sharjah, National Paints, uh, which was established you know, decades ago and is a well-known player in the industry that has actually helped to incubate one of our, if you like, manufacturing startups. So Kima, which manufactures tablets, um, which can then uh, can be put in water and uh, become a surface cleaner, helps to A, eliminate single-use plastics because you buy the bottle once, you fill it with water and you put the tablet in, but more importantly has shown how it's possible for traditional companies or established companies, let's say, in, in the city to help us incubate some of these companies because Kima is actually based in the National Paints uh, facility. You recently discussed plans to set up your own fund to invest in potential startups. I know that's in the very, very early stages, but do you care to extrapolate on that at all? Yes. Over the last eight years, again, we've started the journey of ecosystem building and we've put in many of the important pillars when it's come to that. So whether it's really working on the talent piece, whether it's engaging with regulators, engaging with academia, engaging with the private sector, we've always said since day one that capital should not be the only constraint for an entrepreneur wanting to start a business. But that said, the the flip side of that is capital does play a role. It's not entirely irrelevant. And so I believe it's only a matter of time uh, before a fund is announced and uh, we, again, contribute to the growth of these businesses being born in Sharjah. How much revenue would you estimate that Shara has created and jobs potentially? So of the 170 startups, and, and these are the 170 startups that have incubated at Shara'i, it doesn't count the startups that are actually part of our community that didn't necessarily go through our incubator program, but are engaged with us in one way or another. But if we just look at the 170 startups that actually did go through our incubator program, they have generated over $220 million in revenue, which is a significant contributor to the, uh, to the city's uh, economy. Sharjah is obviously in a very good neighborhood, so to speak, for lack of a better word. You have, it's surrounded by Dubai, you've got Abu Dhabi, just to name a few. In that same breath, though, um, they they tend to take a lot of attention. How does Sharjah stand out? We like to think of ourselves as complementing both Dubai and Abu Dhabi, both of which have their own unique offerings. So Abu Dhabi, for example, may be very strong in certain industries such as defense. It may be very strong in its ability to provide capital. Dubai, obviously, with its infrastructure and the quality of its life it offers, has its own strengths. But Sharjah, as a city, A, offers its own unique uh, lifestyle for those who are interested in more of a family-oriented city, but more importantly for entrepreneurs also has this critical mass of talent. And if you look at all the successful entrepreneurial ecosystems or entrepreneurial hubs around the world, you will always notice that there is a strong link to universities. And so I think we're very lucky that Uh, His Highness had this vision well over 25 years ago to establish this university city, which today houses, I think, well over 20 higher education institutions and over 30,000 students studying across multiple disciplines. And we can now actually build on that foundation uh, to build the future of the economy. What's your generic pitch to people? When discussing Sharjah, or I shouldn't say people, uh, startups. To startups? I would say it's it's uh, three things at the end of the day. One is, as a city, uh, it's a lower cost base. It's it's value for money. It's not a lower cost base. I, I like to say it's value. You get a lot of value for money. Number two, the talent that you have access to. And number three, perhaps because it's a smaller city, the attention that you get. And so for us, it's really quality over quantity. We're not trying to support thousands of startups, but the ones that we do take in, we stand, and again, all our entrepreneurs, I'm sure if you ask any of them, will attest to the fact that that journey never ends. They may graduate from our program after four months or six months, but we are constantly by their side finding ways for us to support their growth. 2023, there was no shortage of tech startup stories, a lot of them revolving around 
AI, augmented reality, just to name a few topics. Big picture in the grand scheme of things, what technologies most excite you in 2024 and beyond? It's hard not to talk about AI, that being the core technology that everybody is talking about. Uh, but I think deep tech in general, which unfortunately, again, we, it's not unfortunate. It is just a natural progression of the ecosystem. We hadn't seen it uh, in the early years. We were seeing a lot of, if you like, copycat startups that were taking models that had worked in other parts of the world and just replicating them uh, for the region. I think what we would love to see in 2024 and the years to come is science-based startups that come from the research that's happening in our universities and turning those into uh, innovations and ultimately businesses that can serve the region and the world. And what can we expect from the Sharjah Entrepreneurship Festival? It's been going on for a few years, but... uh, gets a little bit more ambitious every year. It does, it does. It started in 2017. That was our first edition. It was actually held at the Sharjah Golf and Shooting Club. And it was, you know, we had one stage at the time and maybe 50 or 60 speakers. And the whole point of it in those days was, you know, it was was an opportunity to convene the tech startup ecosystem and have players from the ecosystem, primarily actually from across the world, but also from the region to share learnings and insights. What's happening? happened over time is a couple of things. A, we've made it more regionally focused because obviously over the last eight years, we now have so many regional heroes to showcase uh, with so many stories to share that we no longer really need to focus on bringing in uh, expertise from abroad. So while we do bring in, uh, we continue to host global speakers, I would say 80 to 90 percent of our agenda is really local uh, or regional entrepreneurs and uh, investors with stories to share. That said, we've also moved away from just focusing on tech. And we've made this into a more inclusive event that is meant to be inspiring for anyone of any age that wants to make a change. So the idea is people should walk out after those two days at the festival feeling inspired, feeling like they're ready to fulfill their potential and that they're ready to make or take that next step. And so as a festival, it's grown. We now hold it at the Sharjah Research Technology and Innovation Park, which is where we're currently based. It now has four stages. You have the main stage, you have a creator stage, you still have a tech stage, and then you have a community stage for more of the non-tech SMEs. Beyond that, we have offerings such as a souk for F&B and retailers to take part. We have performances as well from local artists. We have competitions, pitch competitions. We have the Cephi Awards that we also uh, distribute on the night. And uh, we have workshops. We have over 30 workshops this year covering all sorts of topics from, as we've talked about several times, these technologies like AI, through to personal branding, for instance. And so a variety of opportunities to learn and a podcast, actually, similar to yours. So we actually have four or five podcast booths. So all that we've, we're hosting 200 plus speakers this year over the weekend. It's February 3rd and 4th. And we have a lot of podcasters actually uh, joining us to interview some of these speakers after the talks as well. So I hope you'll join us as well. well that's quite exciting and very ambitious. We're still in the infancy of 2024. Looking back at 2023, now that it's in the rearview mirror a little bit, uh, what what did you think of the year in terms of tech startups? No, not necessarily just for Sharjah, but overall. I mean, I think it was a, look, let's be honest, it was a difficult year for, for tech startups. I think in a rising interest rate environment, it's a lot harder for startups. It's, I'm talking about tech startups specifically to to raise investment. And I think that's what we've seen. But, you know, and I've talked about this a lot in the past, that one of the things we do uh, here at Shira is make sure that from day one, startups are thinking about their sustainability, about having a path to profitability and focusing on their unit economics and not just focusing at growth at any cost. And so it was a difficult year for startups that needed to raise funds. I think it will continue to be a difficult year in 2024. But on the flip side, the positive side of the stories is, again, we, especially given the UAE's focus on sustainability last year and it being the year of sustainability, uh, that opportunity for us to move away from just the traditional tech startups that everyone was talking about. Again, nothing wrong with fintech, but a lot of focus on fintech and e-commerce and so on. And see more uh, support for startups 
in the clean tech and climate tech space. And that was exciting for us. We actually uh, infused sustainability into everything that we did uh, last year. So whether it was our youth programs, we partnered with the El Royer Foundation for Education, did an ecopreneurship competition for 150 youth. Uh, who then actually uh, pitched their ideas. We, top, we took the top five ideas to pitch at COP28, which was a very unique opportunity for them, and then took the top three of those five, provided them with funding, and they are currently in our incubator program. So that was one. Another one that we worked on last year was a challenge called the Access Charger Challenge. So that runs on an annual basis with a different theme every year. Last year, the theme was sustainability. We partnered with BIA and with Charger Sustainability City to understand what their challenges were. And so each of these uh, put out a challenge statement, and we opened up the challenge to startups, not just in the region, but around the world. And for instance, BIA, the winning startup actually came from Spain and is setting up here in Sharjah. And what they do is they use, again, our favorite technology, AI, to help sort waste at source. So, you know, um, although things have changed in a positive sense, that, that uh, culture of sorting waste at source is still not entirely there. And so what they do is they've got a piece of hardware that fits onto any existing bin. Uh, the the person just throws the piece of trash in the bin and their technology uses AI and acoustics to sort that uh, sort that waste. So it sounds like a plastic bottle, so it goes here. That sounds like a glass bottle, so it goes here. It sounds like a can, it goes here and so on. And so uh, as part of that uh, competition uh, that they won, they have now received an opportunity to install their technology in 20 bins, on 20 bins in the university city here in Sharjah. And hopefully once that succeeds, they'll have an opportunity to get a bigger contract here in the city. Is there anything else about Shetta that I'm not asking that you want people to know? I think we haven't really talked about how much we engage at the, uni you know, at the university. So obviously we have our flagship incubator program, which is S3. It's a shortened version of Sharjah Startup Studio. This is where incubators come and spend you know, six to eight months and we take them through the process of building their startup. They usually come in with an MVP or a prototype and come out with a startup that has already got customers and is ready to raise investment if required. Uh, but there's a step before that. And I think that's what makes, if you like, Shira unique is we're willing to do the work that's required to get from zero to one. There's a lot of players in the ecosystem that are then willing to take a uh, you know, companies from one to 100, including ourselves. But that zero to one phase, there aren't a lot of people that are, or a lot of players that are willing to do that work. And it's, it's hard work, but it's really about changing mindsets. Um, and again, that's where we work very closely with the universities. So I mentioned the hubs that we have at the universities. They're not just co-working spaces. Those are opportunities for us to engage with the talent very early on while they're still students. We actually co-teach the entrepreneurship course in both uh, universities um, and actually provide a platform for these students to generate ideas and validate their ideas and ultimately then provide an avenue into S3. But a lot of that talent doesn't actually go, you know, one of the things that, again, it's a misconception about entrepreneurship. It's not a linear journey. It's not as simple as you graduate, you come up with an idea, you go through a program, and then you've got a successful business. It's a lot about trying and then failing and then trying and failing and ultimately maybe going out and getting a few years of work experience and then coming back with another idea and succeeding ultimately. And so that's one of the things that we've also seen is that the skill that we're providing the students with are transferable skills. Entrepreneurship is not just about building a business, it's a mindset, it's a set of skills like critical thinking, the 21st century skills that everybody talks about, problem solving, critical thinking, communication, and so on. And so this is really an experiential way for students to learn those skills and ultimately help set them up for success in their careers. Ashal Midfa, thanks so much for joining us on Business Extra. Thank you, Cody. That's it for this episode of Business Extra. Thanks so much for listening. Please remember to follow us wherever you get your podcasting content so you can receive all our episodes as soon as they come out. This episode was produced by Doa Farid, Phil Green, and Arthur Edison. I'm your host, Cody Combs. 